Amen. Welcome to Valley Forge Baptist Temple today. Good to have each one out. And God is the one who lifts up our head. We want to lift up Christ here. I think I see more green than I've ever seen in the service. <laughs> I apologize for not having a green tie. I looked through my whole closet, couldn't find one. But I, I know many of you do, and glad you're out today. In God's house, you're in the right place. We pray through the Psalms. We come to Psalm 14. And many think this is a proverb, but it comes from Psalms. In Psalm 14, 1, David wrote this. He said, The fool hath said in his heart, There is no God. You know, we, we typically think of people like Madeline Murray O'Hare. That's not what the verse says. The fool has said in his heart. He might not say it out loud. You know, I, I think there are a lot of practical atheists. If we don't believe what Jesus said, if we don't believe it, then, then we're the fool saying in our heart, he said you're going to give an account for every word you speak. You're going to give an account for your actions. You're going to give an account for the thoughts you dwell upon. And so let's not be practical atheists. Let's not say in our heart, there's no judgment day. There is. Let's love the Lord with all of our heart, mind, and soul. So let's, let's pray Psalm 14 together. Let's pray together. Our Father, today we come into your house to praise your holy name. We're thankful for the joy it is to share your wonderful gospel with others. As your word says, the fool says in his heart, there's no God. But Father, you have revealed yourself to every unbeliever through the witness of creation and their own personal conscience. In their heart, they know they're without peace and purpose. In their heart, their conscience condemns, condemns them, and they know they are guilty. Many curse you and do evil all around us. Thank you that you are not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Thank you for providing a way for all of us to be forgiven and to come into your forever family. Father, our heart breaks for the lost souls we see all around us. You have said that if we sow in tears, we shall reap in joy. May you increase our burden for reaching the unsaved of our community. We pray for our own lost friends and relatives and co-workers that we know. May we so love Christ that they can see your love in us. May they want the joy of the Lord that we have. Draw more people to yourself and to our church family for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. If you're visiting for the first time, we're glad to have you out today. If you just raise your hand for a moment as the rushers come through the aisles, we'll pass the welcome booklet to you and a connection card. If you would, just please fill that out. You can drop that in the offering plate in just a moment.
Amen. Thank you, choir, for that this morning. Would you take your hymn books out, turn to page 246, stand with me as we sing, I'm pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day, higher ground, sing it with me, on the first and the last. I'm pressing on the upward way. sing it again on the first and the last page 506 As the choir joins you, if you haven't received a copy of the notes for Pastor's Message this morning, the ushers are in the aisle. They'll make sure to get that to you, so raise your hand if you need it at this time. Let's, uh, let's sing now our theme chorus for this year. We've been learning it. Empower me. Nobody knows how weak I am, but the Holy Spirit is the one that gives us the strength. Nobody knows. a number of things on the connection card you might want to consider. If there's joy in serving Jesus, then there's a lot of opportunities for joy for you to be involved in. I uh, think of the nursery ministry as well. Uh, just to share a couple things with you uh, from last week, 
Brandon Joyner, Pastor Brandon Joyner, had his first informational meeting, and uh, we had a group go down from Fairfax Baptist Temple join them. They had some local visitors as well, and uh, so that's the outside of the middle school that uh, they're uh, meeting at. And then in the next slide, uh, they're inside. They had some refreshments uh, be able to get together there. I think had some relatives come over, and so you want to be sure and pray for them. And if you uh, have an inkling of going down that way, plan on being there on a Sunday, and then the first official service will be in a few weeks. We'll have these informational meetings. And then, in the next slide, you uh, see our new deacons. We have Randy Costin and Mark Grubb were ordained as deacons, just so you know who they are. And then in the next slide, we have uh, some pictures for, uh, for those uh, that, that receive gifts there in Puerto Rico from the Share Joy and the Deliches. Uh, right, we help needy children in the community receive Christmas gifts on behalf of the Puerto Rican families, uh, help due to the generous Christmas gift from Valley Forge Baptist. Thank you. It was a delight uh, to partner with you in impacting our town with God's love. Please continue to pray for God's, the gospel message to transform lives. And so we are thankful that the Share Joy Run could be expanded this year uh, to be able to touch those who had uh, special needs down there from the hurricane. And so, again, ongoing uh, fruit and impact uh, because of our church family going all the way back to the uh, Share Joy Run uh, back last, last November. We praise the Lord for that. At this time, we'll ask our ushers to come. We'll receive our tithes and offerings for today. Um, many of you know that my parents have been here for about five weeks. My mom had shoulder surgery, and then my dad went into inpatient uh, therapy, OTPT, as he took a fall middle of December. And so, mom's recovering good. In fact, uh, Jackie was down to see her daughter, Abby, in Virginia, took my mom down. I was going to take my, my dad down in a week. Took him into the hospital Friday night, and uh, they admitted him into ICU with pneumonia. He's now out of ICU. He's in a regular room, but uh, they like him so much. They're going to keep him uh, another four or five days. But thank you for praying uh, for him. Uh, compared to Friday night, uh, seeing him yesterday, a, a marked improvement. And so we're rejoicing that he's in the right place uh, for care. Uh, uh, and then also Sylvia Perry uh, went in the hospital yesterday. Uh, she's not up for visitors, but you can pray for Sylvia. And then Stephanie Goach is having surgery Wednesday. So we want to pray for her as well. Let's see. Got a, a microphone here. So I'm going to ask our, one of our new deacons, Mark Grubb, if he'd ask a blessing upon our offering today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, it is so good to be in your house again this morning. Father, we just praise you and thank you for your Holy Spirit which indwells us, convicts us of sin, Lord, and, and teaches us and guides us and directs us in the ways that we should go. Lord, help us to be sensitive to your spirit. Help us to just be guided and, and uh, Lord, go the right way. We do pray for those that are sick. We, we think of Pastor and Steve's father. We just pray that you would uh, continue to, to heal him and, and raise him up, Lord. Pray for others that are sick in the church, Lord, to pray that you can just continue to, to work in their lives as well. And Lord, as we uh, take this offering this morning, may it be used to further your gospel not only here but around the world. And we ask that your blessing be upon it in Jesus' name. Amen. so many dangers and tolls of this life I have already come and he keeps on giving the grace and the strength to just keep pressing on he's given a promise and I stand on every word his word has said and holding his hand I'll never fear whatever lies ahead I'm gonna make it he's already Working everything for my good. 
spite of the good intentions I've had, sometimes my strength can fail. And though I have tried the very best that I could, my weakness has prevailed. Visible to the eye, yet the force of its incredible power can be seen and felt by every living thing. This presence and power is made known to us from the gentle breeze of the field to the mighty gales that filled the boat's sails on the open water. Like the wind, so is the Holy Spirit of God. When God sent his Holy Spirit upon man, the force of his almighty power was so great, it could only be described as a mighty rushing wind. The effects of that moment has forever changed the world. Out on the high seas, one can experience the awesomeness of the wind and what its great power can do. So should we daily experience the wonder, power, and majesty of the Holy Spirit of God in us and through us. This year, let us live every day empowered by His Spirit. Amen. This is what each of us desire, to be empowered by His Spirit. And we have our own James Earl Jones. That was Randy Costin. Wasn't that great? <laughs> the Holy Spirit is described as the wind, air, force, God's power. Please open your Bibles to John 16 this morning. John chapter 16, last week we asked the question, who is the Holy Spirit? And the answer is, he is my God. And as God, we discovered that the Holy Spirit both convicts of sin and chastises us or spanks us for our sin. We saw that in Acts 5. This week we asked the same question, who is the Holy Spirit? And the answer is, he is my helper. He is my helper. Would you please stand with me as I read from John chapter 16, and verse 7, John 16, verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, 
I will send him unto you. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because they believe not on me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. Howbeit, when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. May we pray. Our Father, we thank you that you have given each Christian the Holy Spirit of God. We thank you for his ministry to glorify Jesus Christ, both in our lives and in our church. May Jesus be lifted up because of this wonderful ministry of the Spirit of God. If there be one in this congregation today that is not saved, not born again, we ask the Spirit of God to move freely to convict of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment, and bring them to yourself, as you did yesterday in the funeral service, bringing souls into your family. And now, Father, I pray for each Christian. Teach us to be yielded to our friend, our comforter, our counselor. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Let's get the setting here in John 16. This is Jesus' last night upon the earth. And as they finish the Passover meal, Jesus announces that one of the 12 is a traitor. Then he washes, takes off his outer garment, and he washes the feet of the disciple, including Judas. And then Judas leaves. Then he tells them that he is going to be leaving them, and he promises the blessings of heaven, but he warns that Satan will come and bring an unrelenting persecution, and he does that with us. But then Jesus said, I'm going to give you everything you need to face persecution courageously. And so whether you live or die, you can be victorious. How? Jesus said, now one of the benefits of me leaving is this. I will send you the comforter. Look with me at verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. <clears throat> there in your notes, the Holy Spirit of God is my comforter. He is my helper. He is my counselor. Now, for you Greek scholars, you may be familiar with the word paraclete. He takes the place of the master's physical presence. It means that we have God himself inside of us. In your notes, comforter or helper or counselor, one who is called to the side of another. Now, we often use the word helper to describe someone who is under us, someone who is subservient to us. But the Bible uses the word comforter or helper to describe someone who is alongside of us, beside us. Uh, someone who is under you does what you say. But someone who is alongside of you works together with you in harmony. And that's the picture we have of the Holy Spirit of God. Uh, he, is simp he is not here simply to do what we ask him to do or tell him to do. He is within us to help us live for Jesus Christ. So there's some wonderful things I'm excited to share with you today. As our helper, he saves us. As our helper, he saves us. The Holy Spirit leads us to salvation. Look with me at verse 8. When he has come, he will reprove the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. And if you are a Christian today, this happened to you. You didn't just say, okay, well, I'm going to become a Christian today. You can't do that all by yourself. It is the work of the Spirit of God, and the Spirit of God convicts of sin, of righteousness, of judgment, and we receive the Lord Jesus as our Savior. Now, the Holy Spirit is not just working among Christians and churches, 
The Holy Spirit of God is working all over the world, reproving, convincing, convicting, drawing people to the Savior. You say, how does he do it? Well, people sin. And when people sin, they have a conscience, and that conscience uh, it brings guilt. And, and the seekers understand that they cannot get to heaven by their good works, and as they seek, the Spirit of God is the one that draws them to the Lord Jesus Christ, the one true Savior of the world. The Holy Spirit shows us we are guilty before the Father, and then he draws us to the Son, Jesus Christ. Now, the night before his death, in this moment, in this scene, Jesus made this statement. This is, is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. What good news for us. Jesus is the only door to heaven. Look with me in your notes. Familiar verse, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. Uh, most of us have a will. Now, some of us need to update it. If you don't have a will, then you, you have made the decision to let some unsaved judge in a probate court decide how best to divide up what you own. You say, well, I'm too young to get a will. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I, just uh, this morning, someone shared, reading through the newspaper, they found some, some uh, fellow on the school board in, uh, uh, out, out west of here who was 47, just passed away. We never know when we're going to lead this life. If you don't have a will, on page two of your notes, you can take action this week. You can call a local lawyer. Uh, you can go to doyourownwill.com. You can contact CLA, Christian Law Association. Uh, they have a, a decent price there. Uh, but you need to do something. Uh, Jesus had a last will and testament. When Jesus died, his will went into effect. And the person writing the will is called the testator. Uh, the, the will or the testament is a legal document expressing how his property and assets are to be distributed at his death. Now, the executor of a will, I, I wonder, do we have anyone here today? You are designated as an executor of anyone's will. Would you raise your hand? Okay, uh, uh, me as well. And so, uh, as executor, we are responsible for executing the wishes of the one who passed away. Uh, though most of us do not prefer talking about our own impending death, it is the wise, it is the responsible thing to do. Whether you are a Christian or not, you need to get a will. The Holy Spirit is the executor of the will of Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit shows you what you and I have inherited. And the New Testament, the New Testament is the will, the last will and testament of Jesus Christ, and you hold it in your hands. You understand when he died, it went into effect, and he rose again. When Jesus Christ died, he purchased all the wealth of heaven, and the Holy Spirit as the executor is now showing you and I what we possess in Christ. You don't receive it because you work hard to get it. No, no, you receive it by faith. It's a gift. You know, there's a lot of Christians that do not understand what they have inherited in Christ. They're living without claiming their inheritance. If you had a great uncle who died and left you a million dollars, don't you think you'd want to claim it? Would you want to claim it? You get a letter in the mail, you're going to go see that lawyer, that executor. And so, if you need to be reminded of that, go to the church website. Go back to the Walk Worthy series from last year and look at Ephesians 1 and 2 to be reminded of, of the great inheritance we have. Uh, also, the Holy Spirit leads us to God's truth. He leads us to God's truth. As our helper, he saves us, leads us to salvation. He leads us to God's truth. Look in verse 13. How be it when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. He will guide you into all truth. God is a God of truth. He speaks truth. He is truth. He is the spirit of truth. And then he teaches truth. In your notes, I gave you John 14, 26. 
But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things. If he tells you he made the world, it's true. If he tells you you will live forever somewhere, it's true. If he tells you that there is a heaven and there is a hell, it's true. If he tells you there's one way to heaven, it's true. I mean, it's all true. He's a God of truth. And the Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of truth. Inside of every Christian is a resident truth teacher, the Holy Spirit, and he does exactly what Jesus did. He is the same kind of teacher. There in your notes, a very interesting verse, John 14, 16. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. If you got a pen or pencil, circle that word another, another comforter. Now, now, in the language that, that um, John wrote this, there are two words for another, and the Spirit of God led him to choose a particular one. Uh, heteros is another of a different kind. Alas, another of the same kind. Jesus said, I will pray to the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, another alas, exactly of the same kind. What does that mean? What that means is he says, as I was your teacher, so he, the Spirit, will become your teacher just like me. That is God. He is God. Do you know what he's saying? The ministry of the Spirit is to teach you the Bible, to turn on the spiritual light so you have understanding of God's Word and God's will in your life. Only the Holy Spirit saves you and teaches you God's truth. And then on page 3, he points us to Christ. We see that in verse 14. He shall glorify me. This is extremely important for us to understand. He shall glorify me. Would you say that with me? He shall glorify me. One more time. He shall glorify me. The Spirit of God glorifies Jesus Christ. You know, there are a lot of Christians and there are many churches that glorify the Holy Spirit. But he has nothing to do with that, nothing at all. He convicts of sin, and he points people to Christ. Jesus said, he shall glorify me. Not, not, only, not, not only does the Spirit point people to Christ, but the Bible does too. Look with me in your notes at, at John 5, 39. Search the Scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they, the Bible, the Scriptures, are they which testify of me. It's pretty clear, isn't it? So as our helper, he saves us. And secondly, as our helper, he guides us. He guides us. The Holy Spirit guides us in life's decisions. Uh, the Bible says that he's going to show us all things. He'll show us all things. He'll, he'll show us of things to come. I mean, this is where it really, it really gets practical. He literally shows us how to live. Isn't that what we want? Isn't that what we need desperately? In the summer of 2016, my second son, Jeremy, and Katie were married, and they were married in Guam where they serve in a ministry at Harvest Baptist Church. And because of the kindness of uh, someone using their frequent flyer miles, uh, Jody and I could both go and, and uh, our kids as well. Uh, just a tremendous, tremendous blessing to do that. And so we get there, and, and Jeremy shows us his, his little island. Uh, he, is, he was our guide. Uh, day after day, uh, we uh, took these, these little trips and uh, had a couple of, several cars, and, and he was in the lead car, of course, and, and guiding us. Uh, and do you know when we came to a fork in the road, I could have said, uh, well, I want to... I want to go this way. And if I did that, I might randomly come across something interesting, or I might come to a dead end. Who knows? I might have come to a pile of trash. You say, but you know, that's kind of like me. I just like to explore. I'm like a free spirit. I, I'm spontaneous. I change my mind on a whim. And you know, there's kind of a certain adventure in being spontaneous and not following a plan. But I want you to imagine... Imagine how Jeremy would feel if I said, well, I want to I go down this road. 
But Jeremy already knows that road leads to a trash dump. That road is nothing but a bunch of broken down furniture and mattresses uh, at the end of it. Now, how would Jeremy know that? Well, because he lived there for three years. And every weekend, he goes out exploring. He's already been down that road. So how would he feel if he's our guide, and I say, but I want to go this way. How's he going to feel? Tell me. Sad? Frustrated? Grieved? You're wasting your time? You really shouldn't be doing that? He wants to show his family, he wants to show his, his tiny little wedding party, his island, the sights of the island. But if we as visitors said, I don't want to go that way, it's going to grieve him. So we didn't do that. We followed our guide. And I want to, I want to show you because I don't think many of you have a trip planned to Guam. <laughs> it's not a place that most people go. Uh, a few Filipinos and Japanese, but uh, unless you have a, a job there, you don't typically go there. But because we followed our guide, uh, I, I want to be able to show you some of the beautiful places uh, that, that uh, God has created in, on this little island. First of all is this, this cliff. Uh, that uh, it's kind of one of those Romeo and Juliet stories where you know how that ended. Uh, but uh, this lover's lookout, and uh, but it was it was quite uh, quite the lookout there. And then there are these water pools that uh, I'd never never seen before. Really uh, amazing sea pools. And the next slide, you kind of see them up up a little bit close, and and uh, you know they could be six inches or eighteen inches, and you kind of sit in them and nice warm warm water there. And then there's this lagoon that uh, it had a little diving board and we're, we're jumping in the water there. It just reminded me of Gilligan's Island and, and kind of a, a fun place to visit. And then the coastline uh, that you can see with, with the cliffs. And, and again, it's not a big island at all, very, very tiny. Uh, but then there's this, this rugged road ahead. And, and uh, you know, sometimes you go down a road and you say, this, this, I don't like this road. Has God ever led you down a rough road? Have you ever had a trial in life in the will of God? Does God's will include trials in your life, some potholes and, and uh, some, uh, some rough terrain and some bumps along the way? So he takes us down this one road, and it's like, you, you got to be kidding. This is the nicest part of it. Uh, but there's some rough road ahead, and, but I want you to know that sometimes the guide will take you down a rough road to lead you to uh, a beautiful beach. And, and that's what happened. Uh, this literally, you, you walked out about, about a quarter of a mile, and uh, then there was like a, a reef uh, that, uh, and you, this is looking back, and we're somewhere right there in the shade, and it was just us. I mean, it was, it was, it's just off of a military base uh, beside it there, and uh, just, just, but the, we, took, we had to take the rough road to get there. And I thought of James 1 and 1 Peter 1, 7 and 2 Corinthians 4, 17, that, that the, the trials of this life have, have a purpose. And, and then in the next slide, uh, this, uh, this beautiful turquoise uh, lagoon, and you say, man, oh, man, something so beautiful that why would God create it with so much color and so much beauty? Going through Exodus this last week, when God was giving the plans for the tabernacle, I love this phrase. I love this phrase. He says, I want you to build it for glory and beauty. For glory and beauty. That was the tabernacle. That was the temple. And that is his, his uh, beautiful uh, creation. And then in uh, the next uh, uh, slide there is just... Uh, uh, we didn't do that, but that's where Jeremy goes hiking. Uh, and, uh, you know, Guam is overrun with black snakes, so I'm glad I didn't go down that, uh, uh, that particular way. But why were they, we there? We were there because of a wedding. And so that was the, uh, the day of the wedding on the Asan Beach where the Americans landed to uh, liberate uh, the people of Guam from the Japanese invaders. I want to ask you are, you, are you willing to believe and trust the guide of your life. 
If I wouldn't have trusted my guide on the island of Guam, I wouldn't have seen those beautiful places. We saw more beautiful places in five days than a lot of the people who live on Guam. It's right there, but they don't go to it. They don't go to it. But we had a guide that led us to these places. You have a guide. He wants to lead you when it comes to dating, when it comes to marriage, when it comes to parenting, when it comes to work, when it comes to finances, when it comes to, to forgiveness, when it comes to relationships, when it comes to friendships. And he has told us, this is how, this is the road you should take. And if you don't take this road and you take another road, that road is a dead end. Uh, that road is a garbage dump. That road is a waste of time. That road is nothing but a bunch of circles. Follow your guide. Listen to your guide. And he will lead you to, to beauty and glory in your life. It's not this, thou shalt not. Yeah, thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not lie. Thou shalt not covet. Honor your parents. Obey your parents. This is not a mean God. This is a loving God. He's guiding us so that we can have beauty in our life. Does this make sense? Does it make sense? Then we need to yield and listen to our guide. He directs our paths. Psalm 23, 3, he leads me in the paths of righteousness. And so he directs us in two ways. And I'd like to be able to talk about that for a moment. He, he gives us a field of choices, and he directs our specific steps. He directs us by giving us a field of choices, and he directs our specific steps. Knowing the difference between the two is really important in walking with the Spirit as your guide. Think about Adam. God said to Adam, of every tree thou mayest freely eat. God said to Joshua, the Lord God is with you wheresoever thou goest. Jesus said to the apostles in Matthew 10, whatsoever city or town ye shall enter in, God gave his children a range of choices to choose. From that, we're all in God's perfect will, a field of choices. To say that the Holy Spirit is our guide does not mean that we have to have the Holy Spirit to tell us what fruit to eat when God has given us the whole forest of trees to eat from. Well, except for one, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It's not spiritual to say, okay, God, well, well, well tell me which tree to eat from today. Am I supposed to eat from the pear tree today? Or should it be the banana tree today? Or it should it be from, uh, you know, from the, the persimmon tree? Or persimmon's a tree? Uh, and, you know, God says, hey, it's whatever tree you want to eat, you can choose it. You can choose. You have a field uh, of choices. And, and yet there are some Christians uh, who are so paralyzed by their inability to make a choice. They say, I don't want to make the wrong choice. God says, make a choice, make a choice. And if you make a bad choice, then learn from it so you can learn to make good choices the next time. You have a field of choices out there. And there are many things in our lives, and God gives us a choice, the freedom of choice. I think of the first mission. Uh, Jesus had his 12 disciples. He calls them apostles in Matthew 10. And he says, now go preach all throughout Galilee. Lord, what town do you want me to go to? Or wheresoever, whatsoever. No, no, I want to know what town you want to send me to. Whatsoever town you choose. If they don't like you in that town, go to the next one. It's a field of choices. God wants us to use our minds in making these choices. Psalm 32, 9. Be ye not as the mule, which have no understanding, whose mouth must be held in with a bit and bridle. Have you ever heard someone say, or have you said it yourself? I didn't want to do it, but God made me. Psalm 32, 9. What about the mule? You, you, you think about that. Or Joshua, uh, he's getting ready to cross into the Jordan, and the Lord doesn't even give him a battle plan. He says, wherever you go, just be strong and courageous because I am with you. Well, Lord, do you, do, you, do you want me to go in the northern area or the southern area? Do you want me to split the forces in two or three or four? God says, whatsoever, wheresoever. 
You pick, you choose. You just pick a city. I will be with you. The whatsoevers, the wheresoevers, and the any trees. We often needlessly stress over decisions that God has given us a freedom to choose. Don't blame the Holy Spirit leadership as, as a lack of the leadership because you can't make a decision. Sometimes it's just our unbelief. Sometimes it's our unwillingness to take a step of faith. Sometimes you just need to walk by faith into the field of choices that God gives us. And sometimes God will direct your specific steps, your decisions. And that happens too. We see that at the bottom of page three. The Spirit said to Philip, go near and take this chariot. Peter, to Peter, the Spirit said, behold, three men are seeking you. They're knocking at your door. I want you to go with them. On page four, to the pastors in Antioch, the Spirit said to them as they fasted and prayed, separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. Very specific directions. God can direct specific decisions. I mean, Philip is on the road to Gaza, and I'm sure there is more than one chariot going by. I want you to get on that chariot. Well, Lord, which chariot? And the Spirit says, that one, that one, that one right there, the one with the red, the red wheels. And he got on the specific right chariot where that Ethiopian eunuch was driving, reading Isaiah chapter 53. Peter was praying on the housetop, and he hears a knock at the door. The Lord says, three guys are down there. They're knocking on your door, and I want you to go with them. Not just any three men in the street, with these three. To the pastors in Antioch, there's a whole bunch of people, uh, prophets and teachers, and they're, they're praising the Lord, and people are getting saved and baptized, and they're singing, and they're fellowshipping, and, and God says, separate me. Th those two men right there, those two men, you're going to send them out. Very specific, the very first missionary team. We need to avoid the ditches. A long time ago, a preacher compared God guiding us by the Spirit with a country road, with a ditch on, on the right side and a ditch on the left side. And he said, you want to stay out of the ditches. You want to stay in the middle of the road. And so, so let's avoid the two ditches of discerning God's leading. And the first one is that God can't speak to you. The ditch on the left is the ditch that says, God can't speak to you. And there's a group that believes that God's only leading is his general will found in the Word of God. And if you say that God is leading you, they are going to get offended because they say God does not lead people today other than the Bible. And I think we need to avoid that ditch. You're going to find it in a lot of different books. There's a Decision Making in the Will of God by Friesen. There's a Just Do It. There's, there's books out there that say God is mute, God is deaf, God is silent, other than that which he has written in the Word of God. God can't speak to you. And then the other ditch is every thought that you have is God's voice. The ditch on the right are those who think God talks all the time like a chatty Kathy doll. Does anybody remember the chatty Kathy doll? Art, how in the world would you remember that? <laughs> you have a sister with the kid, okay. <laughs> chatty Kathy was the first talking doll made by Mattel. Uh, she had a little string in the back of her neck, and when you pulled that string, she talked. Oh, Kathy loves you. Pull it again. Oh, give me a bottle. Pull it again. Oh, change my diaper. Uh, just pulling the string, you can get chatty Kathy to say what you want to hear. And there are some that are in that ditch, and they think that every time they pull the string of prayer, whatever thought that they have, that is the voice of God. That's a ditch. That's equally dangerous. We can't just pull the string and expect God to speak. Here's what I've discovered about God's leading. 
by his spirit. Two things about God's leading, you and me, and then the Bible. How to discern God's specific leading. First of all, it's often an interruption. It's often an interruption. And that's what happened in Acts chapter 13. Uh, They are teaching, they're preaching, they're praising God, and boom, God interrupts and says, I I want you to separate Barnabas and Saul. Uh, Peter's on his rooftop praying, and there's a knock at the door, and God says, go with these three guys. He was interrupted. He was in, uh, and then there's Philip. He's in revival. Leave the revival. (coughs) Go get on that chariot with that eunuch. So you start with a field of choices, But then God interrupts and says, I want this direction. I want this specific uh, uh, choice to be made. And then number two, God impresses my heart and conscience with an overwhelming burden or desire followed by perfect peace. I think we might have a slide on that. I jumped ahead. God impresses my heart and conscience with an overwhelming burden or desire followed by perfect peace. Now, God's specific leading never violates the Bible. Never, never, never. God will never lead you to disobey a clear command of Scripture. Never. But he can impress upon your heart this overwhelming burden, this overwhelming desire, and you will say, this is God's will for my life. After I was widowed in 1993, I began praying in 1994, that God would lead me about the possibility of remarrying. Online dating hadn't been invented yet. It was before ChristianMingle.com. It was before eHarmony.com. There were no single pastor with kids dating.com uh, <laughs> back then. If there was, I'm sure I would have uh, signed up. But there were missionaries and pastors who thought they were professional matchmakers. If I, if I heard this line once, I heard it a dozen times. I've never done this before in my life, but I think you should meet so-and-so. And I did. Uh, it happened dozens and dozens of times, a field of choices, and then I started going out on dates, usually out of state. Uh, one of the girls I dated, dated later married someone else, and she died within two years of that marriage. You know, the more I dated, the more I prayed. If you'd have been in my situation, you'd pray too, all right? I asked God, open doors, close doors, make it clear to me or make it clear to the girl that I meet. And the Lord made it clear. Either they didn't want to see me again or I didn't want to see them again in a Christian kind of sort of way, all right? (laughs) Just being honest. (laughs) And then I started writing Jody, and she started writing me back. And and, and in those letters, a friendship began. We weren't even talking. A friendship began before we ever met and before we ever talked. God's leading was by open doors. God's leading was by his peace. And out of a field of 90 contacts, after nine different dates, there was one girl one girl that God was leading me to, and she didn't even live in our country. (laughs) But she did speak English, all right? (laughs) I had a short list. Saved, love God, pretty. (laughs) Mrs. Steve, one of our deacon's wives, used to say, Pastor, Pastor, be be careful, be careful. Uh, Man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. I said, Mrs. Steve, I'm a man, not God. (laughs) (laughs) I had my list. (laughs) Told you I'm being honest. Lost my place in my notes. (laughs) See, what was else on that list? Let's see, say, godly, pretty, speaks English. It wasn't a long list. Oh, yeah, she needed to like little boys. <laughs> and she needed to want to love the ministry. Uh, but only God, uh, not only did God need to lead me, but God needed to lead her. And God needed to lead her parents. 
And he did by his spirit. Very specific. What did he do? He impressed my heart with an overwhelming burden and an overwhelming desire. She's the one, the specific one for me and for her. When the Holy Spirit guides, it's often this interruption or it's often this, this overwhelming burden or desire. God talked to Phil. Oh, by the way, I can't do this in the second service. <laughs> Thanks for saying yes. <laughs> she had a cold. I might be coughing and sneezing next week, but it's worth it. It's worth it. So God talked to Philip. This is important. God talked to Philip about something he wanted Philip to do. God talked to Peter about something he wanted Peter to do. Uh, God talked to, those, those, to Paul about something he wanted Paul to do. There's a clue here. If, if someone comes to you and says, God, talk to me, and he's telling me what you should do, you can say, well, thanks for the insight, but I will pray and I will listen for what he tells me to do. When God is speaking to my heart, you know who it's always about? It's about me. I've got to change this attitude. I need to start or stop this or that. He talks to me about me. He doesn't talk to me about you. Never flippantly say, God said to me or God told me. Better to be cautious when you claim God's leading in your life and only counsel others what is the clear, revealed word of God. Don't claim God's voice in the life of someone else. And so as our helper, as our helper, uh, we, we see he saves us, he guides us. One more real quick, and that is he gives us assurance. He gives us assurance. Then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria, and they were edified and walking in the fear of God and in the comfort, there it is, the paraclete, the comfort of the Holy Ghost, and they were multiplied, Acts 9, 31. You know that, that parents, parents can't give assurance of salvation. And so many try. Well, don't you remember when you were four, January 3rd, you were saved? Don't you remember? We were sitting in the bed. Don't you remember? If they can't remember, don't say that to them. Parents can't give assurance of salvation. Pastors and churches can't give assurance of salvation. Good theology can't give assurance of salvation. It is the Spirit of God. Only the Holy Spirit. Look with me in your notes there. The Spirit himself, itself, beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that way we may also be glorified with him. How do you know you are saved? Someone said it this way. I know in my knower. I know in my knower, it goes beyond my mind. Sometimes I don't have words to explain that I know in my knower. I know in my spirit that assurance is the spirit that he gives it to me. We can know that we know we are destined. We are joint heirs for Christ. I was taught as a little boy two prayers, the, uh, the food prayer. Uh, God is good. God is great. And we thank him for this food. Amen. Uh, and then the bedtime prayer. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. That didn't help me. <laughs> I was like, what an awful prayer to teach kids at bedtime. You might die tonight. <laughs> that didn't give me assurance. But you know, as a 15-year-old teenager, when I got saved, I got assurance. It wasn't my parents, and it wasn't my church, and it wasn't good theology. It's the Holy Spirit. Do you have that today? Do you have that kind of deep, abiding assurance? This is what the Holy Spirit does. He is our helper. He is our comforter. He gives us assurance. What a way to live, to have assurance that when you die, you go to heaven, that God works all things together for good to them that love God. 
What wonderful assurance, assurance and comfort. He gives it to me and he can give it to you. Isn't that what the Holy Spirit does for us? He knows the word of God because he's the author of it, 2 Timothy 3.16. There in your notes. Doesn't it make sense to listen to our comforter, our helper, our guide? Follow him. Follow him. Yield to him. Surrender to him. May we pray. Father, thank you that the Holy Spirit of God is our helper, our comforter, our guide. I thank you for all that he does for us to save our soul, to teach us truth, to lead us in life, to lead us to the beautiful, the beautiful places in our lives. And Father, we have this rebellious, sinful spirit within us that wants to go our own way, to do our own thing. Show us that our way is the wrong way, the dead end, the trash dump. And may we be quick and obedient to believe, to obey, and to follow your leading sometimes in the field of choices and sometimes very specific steps and decisions. With their heads bowed, our eyes closed, you'd say, Pastor, if I died today, I know I'd go to heaven because I am saved, I'm born again. I have assurance. If you have assurance by the Spirit that heaven is your home, would you simply raise your hand? I'm a child of God, I've been saved all over. Thank you, let me put your hands down. If you don't have that assurance, the sovereign God of the universe brought you to this moment to be convicted of sin and drawn to Christ. If you'd like to receive the Lord Jesus, call upon him and be born again today. Right now, would you simply raise your hand? I'll lead you in that salvation prayer. You, you might have been brought up in a, in, a, in a ministry home. Do you have assurance? If not, would you raise your hand? and receive Christ today, as five did at a funeral yesterday. You can do that today, anyone at all. Is there anyone here today you'd say, you know, I, I keep resisting my guide. He says left and I go right. He says right, I go left. Don't you think today is a good day to surrender and yield and follow the Holy Spirit? If you do, I promise you, he will bring you to great joy and beauty. Now, sometimes the road is rough. I, I know that. But that's okay, because at the end of the road, there's the beautiful, scenic experience with the Spirit. Lord, help us to surrender to you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. As we stand together, we sing a song of invitation. Come every soul by sin oppressed, there's mercy with the Lord. Maybe you want to pray in your seat or pray at the altar. You come, whatever decision is we sing in this first verse.